Welcome to another edition of Ada Pi Sports Talk. I'm Joe Bailey. Alongside me is Kenny Kress, Elliot Stern, and Jacob Rayburn. Uh, for this show, we're going to talk about week zero of the high school football season. It was quite an eventful week of football. There are also some big changes coming to area high school sports with some Central Coast teams or schools possibly seceding to the central section. We'll talk about that and uh, look ahead to the week one of the high school football season. This is 805 Sports Talk. Thank you for tuning in. So the most high profile matchup for this week is uh, Rigetti hosting St. Joseph for the Battle for the Shield. Everyone in Santa Maria loves that matchup. This is the um, sixth year that it's been back. And actually, um, Rigetti actually holds a lead in the series since the return of it, and uh, Rigetti leads three to two. But St. Joseph actually won last year, 42 to six, ending a, a two-game win streak for Rigetti. Uh, the Warriors host the Knights Friday night. I'll be there covering that game, and it will be our webcast game of the week. So be sure to tune in. But uh, earlier this week, I caught up with both teams at the Battle for the Shield luncheon at Rooney's in Orchid. Uh, talked to both coaches and uh, players from both teams and uh, I guess the big key for both coaches was just execution. This is just the second game of the season so they're trying to make sure you know they're just executing, everybody's lined up right, tackling is on point, you know the right formations and all that stuff. So that was really a, a big talking point on Wednesday when the teams met up for, for the annual luncheon. Um, also talking to uh, Rigetti linebacker Cody McCormick, he kind of intimated to me that you know it's going to be a real physical game I think Rigetti is going to try to focus on being physical that's usually what they do they will have they usually have a little more depth and size than St. Joseph so I think it's going to be an interesting matchup Rigetti is going to going to try to be a little more physical St. Joseph has a little more speed and playmaking ability with a, a deep receiving core and a Dino Maldonado looked really good in his first varsity start throwing for uh, almost 200 yards and two touchdowns and uh, was St. Joseph's leading rusher so it should be an interesting matchup. Both teams lost their season openers. Rigetti lost to uh, Notre Dame 35, or Rigetti lost to Bishop Diego 21-0 at home, and St. Joseph lost to Notre Dame 35-21, both at home. So it's going to be an interesting matchup. And um, you know, if I had to pick, I'd probably pick St. Joseph to win that one. I think it's going to be close for the first half, but uh, I think St. Joseph just has a little bit too much talent to to, and uh, and they'll pull away. Um, so uh, check out what the guys had to say about a Friday night's matchup. What did you learn about your team from Friday night's game against Notre Dame? You guys were, were hang, hanging with them, lost 35-21. Uh, were you proud? Were you happy with everything you saw Friday night? Is there some, some areas that kind of stood out to you you need to work on? Uh, areas that stood out to work on, again, I mean, just going back to the mistakes, you know, we, again, when we play, uh, first of all, we're always going to have a, a small margin of error, of error uh, with uh, just our you know, lack of size, lack of numbers. Um, so we can't, can't make mistakes. And, and we have to capitalize when we get opportunities. So uh, that's going to continue this week. Uh, you know, they got a big squad. They've got they've got uh, a lot of good guys. So um, we're really going to have to do our best to um, to compete with them, uh, play in and play out. Here it is. This is your what fourth edition? Yeah. Of the Battle for the Shield. Right. You, you've got some experience in this game. What do you think this game comes down to against St. Joe? Well, I like like any big game. You know, execution and uh, discipline and. Uh, you know, just trying to do what we've been you know, practicing all week, and, and uh, hopefully we, we come out and, uh, and and give it our best shot. Um, what do you guys learn from uh, last week's game? Is there anything you can build off? Was there some some stuff looking at film that you, you can get better at? What, what do you try to learn from you know having one game under your belt? Well, that's a big evaluation there. It is really the opening dress rehearsal, if you will, and uh, we had a few players that maybe weren't in the right spot and and then of course early in the season it's uh you know tackling and some fundamental things that we're still working on i was i was really pleased with some of our discipline only having two penalties for the night so uh you know just a couple of those little personnel changes and uh just just uh getting our uh basics you know reads down and things like that um, i'm hoping for a bigger jump this week uh, what about on the field if you have to name one big thing that you guys got to execute well on the field what do you think it is well, uh, I, I like our balance. Uh, if we can get a little more balance on offense, uh, throwing the ball, running the ball, I think that's uh, that's hard to defend. And then, uh, you know, of course, on defense, just playing sound, disciplined defense. So, battle for, for the shield, you guys hold it um, this year. How important is it to keep it? You know, it means pretty much everything every year. Of course, this is a game we look forward to, especially my senior year. Uh, we're just going to go out, do our best, and hopefully keep it back. Um, 
what do you think you guys got to do on that field to, to retain that shield? Um, your Getty started the season with a loss. You guys, you know, played Notre Dame really well, but also took a loss. What do you guys got to do on the field to make sure you guys keep that shield? You know, we just got to play our uh, brand of ball. Uh, can't get too caught up in the hype, obviously. It's going to be fun getting riled up, rival week, but we just have to play our brand and uh, just stick to our game plan. Um, what's it been like at school? I know there's so many, every day you guys dress up and it seems like the student body really gets into it. Does that actually impact you guys? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, it gets us pretty fired up, you know, to see the students uh, get involved and get really fired up. So yeah, it's really fun. How are you feeling after that first game? Are you, are you, is it a little harder to get going, you know, early in the season or are you a little fresher? No, I think uh, it was good to play such a competitive team. Uh, they were really tough uh, and we battled really well, especially for our first game. We had a, a few mistakes, but we worked it out this week and we feel pretty good. All right, here it is, the uh, battle for the shield. You're a senior now. Um, how do you feel about this matchup against St. Joe? I'm feeling pretty confident. Uh, it's always a big game, I feel. Uh, I just, I, we're just gonna play hard like we always do. Pound the ball, see how it goes. Do you feel that it is a different game when you guys actually get out there on the field? Do you feel like it's, it's any different out there? Oh yeah, for sure. From people on the sidelines, it's a way different perspective on, for on the field. Uh, you're just really in the zone. You you block, try to block everyone out and just do you. Okay. Uh, how do you guys feel after um, you know starting out the season last week? You you feel you guys learned some stuff from that game. You feel you can make improvements. How do you feel after you know starting the season and have one game under your belts? Well, I I felt like before the half we were doing pretty good, and then after the half we just. We were just getting tired, but we're conditioning more, playing hard more. The transitions of practices are getting a lot quicker. Uh, but that was a tough loss. They're a pretty good team, but we won't. We we can only work on that. The battle for the Shield Friday night. You're a senior. How much does this game mean to you, uh, playing Sejo? Uh, this game means a lot. It's a probably the biggest game that we have all year. You know, it's right across the street rivalry. Rivalry. It's been going on for a while, and I'm just glad we can play in it again. What do you guys got to do to beat St. Joe? Um, you know, they started out their season with the loss. You guys lost um, to Bishop Diego to start the season. What do you think this game is going to come down to? Uh, I think it's going to be coming down to who wants it more, who's going to be more physical, who's going to get down there, who's going to get it done. It's going to be a one physical game. That's all I got to say. Okay. Uh, you play a linebacker position. St. Joe is really known for those skill position players they have this year. You know, some receivers. The quarterback, Dino Maldonado, looked pretty good his first game. Um, what's it like playing playing against that St. Joseph offense? Uh, it's going to be good. I just. We just all got to make sure on the defense that we line up in our correct assignments. We do what we got to do. And, uh, we should get the job done. All right. Um, how much momentum can you guys get from a win over St. Joe? Do you think that can kind of get you guys going a little bit? How, how big of a win do you think that would be for you guys? I think that's going to be a big win because I know that all, all the teammates are, uh, are ready for this. They want this win, especially because... So our sports editor, Elliot Stern, was actually at St. Joseph's loss to Notre Dame in, in week zero, and he's going to kind of break down that game for us. and. Uh, kind of tell us what St. Joseph did right and what they did wrong. Thank you, Joe. The uh, uh, Knights lost to the Knights. It was a all-night night, uh, but it was uh, Notre Dame Knights of Sherman Oaks. They won it 35-21. to 21. And uh, 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 first, let me say that uh, Notre Dame is in uh, Division Two, which is the big schools, the most powerful schools, most successful over the last few years in this new realignment that they've got where there are numbered divisions and where they uh, came up with a uh, power rankings and everybody got ranked to strength of schedule, win losses, scores, uh, and uh, St. Joe's in Division Five. So even though uh, uh, Notre Dame had a three and seven record last year, they had a lot of kids coming back uh, and they play in a, in a powerful mission league uh, with schools that we've all heard of before, like uh, Sarah, uh, that are regular regular football powerhouses. Uh, but St. Joe uh, held its own. They uh, gave the kids from uh, Sherman Oaks what for, really. Uh, this game was dead even until right at the end of the third quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter, uh, and uh, Sherman Oaks Notre Dame scored a couple touchdowns and St. Joe just wasn't able to respond and what happened at the end of the game was in trying to catch mm -hmm. up Maldonado uh, threw a couple ill-advised passes and uh, they got picked off and it was the end of the comeback but uh, uh, St. Joe actually started the game uh, going up first uh, when uh, Maldonado uh, hit Nate Guzman uh, he's a returning starter, been there a while, uh, with a 47-yard touchdown pass, and it was pretty. Now, this is uh, Maldonado's first varsity start. 
He saw uh, Guzman cutting a, from uh, right to left over the middle on a slant. He hit him in stride, and Guzman just was off to the races, 47-yard touchdown. Uh, they were up seven to nothing, but that lead lasted uh, ten seconds, maybe. The um, star of the game for Notre Dame was a kid named Khalid Taylor, and he's already been recruited uh, to D1 programs, and he's committed to a big school. Uh, he took the kickoff, and he had his foot like two inches in front of the goal line. If his foot, foot was a touch back, then it would have been a touch back, and the ball would have come out. Uh, but he was still in the field to play, and he took that ball, and he went up the middle, cut to his left, and it was off to the races, 99-yard touchdown, and 10 seconds after St. Joe took the lead, uh, the game was all tied up. So, uh, uh, and then the, the each team scored to uh, a couple more touchdowns in the first half, uh, and uh, it was... Uh, uh, eventually, Notre Dame took a 21-14 lead in the third quarter, actually, but St. Joe came back on an 80-yard march, uh, 13 plays to uh, even it up at 21-21 uh, at the end of the third quarter. But um, uh, what they they had a uh, they gave up another touchdown. We're down 28-21, and Mason Bialy kept the drive alive with a, a circus catch that was uh, good for a first and goal at the six, uh, and that uh, that evened the score at 21 all, but uh, that was it. They, they, it was a, a, an interception, they went on for a, a score, and St. Joe looked good against a big time school, but uh, ended up losing uh, their opener 35-21. So I saw them we saw what happened to Rigetti. Kenny's going to talk about that in a bit, but um, I'm, I'm agreeing with Joe. I think that uh, uh, the St. Joe kids have a little bit more firepower, and Rigetti's going to give them a good ba battle. I don't think they'll be shut out this week, but I think that uh, St. Joe will have the edge going into Friday night's game at Rigetti High School. So while I was at St. Joe, uh, Jacob was at uh, Lompoc High School where they had that really big battle, uh, the season opener or, that's become a traditional huge match here on the Central Coast, Arroyo Grande at Lompoc High School's Hauk Stadium. Uh, and that turned out to be an interesting game. J uh, Jacob has the details. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it involved many of the things I hoped it would in terms of the, the top players in the area making big plays. Sawyer May didn't have the greatest completion percentage that he would have liked, but he delivered some passes that maybe only Dino Maldonado would be able to compete with, uh, considering how well he had his first varsity start over at St. Joseph. But uh, ultimately, with Lompoc winning 28-14 and it being 28-7 at one point, um, it would be very easy to say Lompoc dominated, but I think you could take positives out of the, ex uh, the performance for both teams. If you're a Lompoc Braves fan, you have to be heartened by how quickly the offensive line came together and how well they played in the first half. Um, Lompoc's worst runs for most of the first half, most of the three qu first three quarters, were five-yard runs. You know, this wasn't really three yards in a cloud of dust from Lompoc High. They were doing really well. Uh, on the flip side, Aurora Grandi stiffened in the second half considerably and did much better, coupled with the fact that Lompoc had some mental, mental missteps with penalties. So uh, Aurora Grandi actually stopped um, Lompoc short of rushing for 300 yards in the game, which is something that looked almost certainly to happen in the first half of the game. And so Aurora Grandy did in some ways what they did last year in the playoffs when they surged back against Thousand Oaks. They showed that Tom Goosen coaches his guys to not give up, to stay calm, and work your way back into the game. And they had several opportunities actually to get even closer. Uh, so my take on it is, is that Lompoc should be favored uh, each week the rest of the season. They've earned that with how they played against Aurora Grandy and looking at the rest of their schedule. Uh, and on that note, Lompoc now travels to Napomo, which the last two years has given them a real hard time. Last year, Napomo held them to 18 points, by far their lowest point total of the whole season. Two years ago, it took overtime to beat Napomo. Uh, this time, though, Napomo's coming off a loss. 
uh, to Pioneer Valley. I've got Lompoc going up to Napomo and running through that Titans defense that could not stop Emmanuel Alcantar of Pioneer Valley, which does not bode well for being able to stop Toa Tawa and company. Um, so I, I have Lompoc winning that game. And then uh, for Cabrillo, Cabrillo dropped a 42 to six game up at front, uh, over in Frontier in Bakersfield. And really it's just the same story that they've struggled with for a while now. Their defense puts up a good fight, gets overwhelmed, and their offense can't get the ball moving. They got shut out the first three quarters of the game at Frontier. And now they face a Dos Pueblos team that went toe to toe with San Juan Hills and nearly beat a pretty darn good Division Three team. This is not the Dos Pueblos that won three games last year. Um, so Cabrillo needs to have a really good showing because after this they play four teams that they have a, a better chance with. You know, they play like Santa Maria and Templeton and Morro Bay, all stuff like that over the course of the next month you've got to build some positive momentum going into that stretch. I think Cabrillo drops the game against Dos Pueblos, um, but the much more important thing for the Cox and Don Willis is does the offense show improvement? And if they do, you have to feel better about the next month after that. So uh, that's kind of how I feel about uh, the Lompoc Valley's week zero and week one. And Kenny, I know that you got to watch uh, some good football on Friday and have your own thoughts about the future for uh, some of the teams in the area. Yes, all of the scoring in the Bishop Diego Rigetti game was done in the third quarter, and it was all done by Bishop Diego. It was a 21 to zero final. Rigetti's defense held its own at times. It won a lot of battles against the Bishop Diego offense. Bishop Diego's offense won a lot of battles against the Rigetti defense. Rigetti's offense really struggled. I don't think, I don't think they got past the Bishop Diego 42. The only thing that seemed to work with any consistency for them was some hard running between the tackles by Damian Robles. To do anything against St. Joseph, I think they really need to get some sort of passing game going. The passing game really struggled last week. And they need to get some sort of outside running game going. I think they will score against St. Joseph, but as I said, unless they get some sort of passing game, some sort of outside running game going, I think it's going to be a very night, long night for that offense. I think St. Joseph has a big edge coming into this one. Uh, on Monday, I saw something pretty unique. St. Joseph boys and girls cross country runners met up at the Santa Barbara County Animal Shelter off Foster Road and they teamed up with shelter dogs and they went on a training run together and there were big dogs and little dogs all leashed up of course some of the dogs wanted to visit with the other dogs but the runners did a very good job of handling them and making it so that everyone could get on their way there was the run was about one and a half miles runners and dogs went west on foster road and then returned to the animal shelter yeah. i think this is a good thing real good thing i hope it takes off uh, it gives dogs a chance to get exercise um, gives gave the runners a chance to be exposed to the dogs and maybe they can spread the word that They've been in contact with some very adoptable dogs, and hopefully some of these dogs will find a permanent home soon. I, it's a real good community thing, and I hope it takes off from here. Um, although we're getting a St. Joe, both lost week zero. All was not lost for uh, Santa Maria Valley teams, especially Santa Maria High School. They started the season with a 15-12 to 12 home win over San Luis Obispo. We had a reporter over there, uh, Blake Truitt. Kind of led that team uh, at the quarterback position, so it was really good to see um, Santa Maria start with the win. Um, they might have a tougher battle Friday night against Santa Barbara, but uh, it's good to see the Saints start with the win. And then over at Pioneer Valley, uh, we kind of briefly talked on talked on that. They beat the Panthers, beat Napomo 35-21. Emmanuel Alcantara almost had 200 yards rushing, a couple touchdowns. 
Pioneer Valley was really impressive. That that was a game I was at. So it's good to see that two Santa Maria Valley teams did start the the season with a win. Uh, we can't forget about Orchid Academy, who uh, played actually at San Ynez High School in an eight-man game. They blew out Chadwick, and they're actually the first Central Coast team to move to two and zero after a, a team pulled out of their week one game, their second week game. So um, Orchid Academy gets mm -hmm. an, a forfeit win. So Orchid Academy is actually two and zero. So pretty good football results for uh, the rest of the Santa Maria Valley. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, um, we all picked Santa Maria to win. Um, and the fact that they pulled it off is, was, I thought, uh, one of the great stories of the night. And then Pioneer Valley performing so well with Emmanuel Alcantar not going into the week as the number one running back and leaving week zero as one of the top performers in the whole area. Yeah. They, um, Pioneer Valley looked really good overall, but Alcantara was totally impressive. You know, he's just a junior, but he had some great cuts, had a long 62-yard touchdown run. Um, I know you talked to Leo Partita Ruiz before the season started and kind of hyped him up a little bit. He was impressive. Matthew Garcia, their, their new quarterback, was good. So PV just up and down looked really good. I don't know if that had to do with Napomo not being as good as we thought they are or PV is a lot better than we thought they were, but they looked really good. And, you know, talking – back to Santa Maria that was a great win and, and I know a lot of those players and the coaches kind of told their student body that they were expecting a win they were pretty much guaranteeing guaranteeing a win over slow for so for see them to see them come through with a guarantee and, and you know make it happen was good yeah. 15 to 12 wins always good uh, to start the season with a victory. Yeah, Coach uh, Dan Ellington was really confident and the kids fed off of that and he told me before the season began that he was expecting to win uh, against San Luis Obispo. What, wasn't expecting it to be a, a loss. He, he had all the kids believe in him. He, he, his system is, is now in place for two years and the kids have learned it and it wasn't a learning curve as much as execution and, and they bought into it and came out with a win. Uh, so I'm looking for good things from Santa Maria this year. And you know the Orchid Academy, it's uh, San Jacinto Valley Academy uh, said that they didn't want to travel on the three-day weekend, uh, but everybody plays a three-day weekend. It's always a, a Labor Day, Friday night, Labor Day weekend games. It's tradition, so I don't know why they decided that this year. They didn't want to do that, but they forfeited this Friday night game to Orchid Academy that would have been at Pioneer Valley. Uh, so don't go to Pioneer Valley expecting to see the game because it's not going to be there. But uh, uh, apparently the CIF could take serious uh, measures against San Jacinto Valley Academy for uh, pulling out of this game, inc including f having them forfeit their entire season. So the, the, the CIF is not taking this situation lightly. Uh, but uh, uh, so Orchid Academy, they, they're going to play uh, Mojave, uh, one of the top four teams in Division One's eight-man division mm -hmm. one the last few years so uh, you know they get an extra week to practice and uh, not get banged up and they won't lose any players this week so there's a small blessing in, in there for them but they they really all wanted to take the field yeah and they play um, in Orchid Academy played last week at San Inez Right. That was and their home game because they play on the public school fields in Santa Maria, mm -hmm. but even so, St. Joe also had a home game, so it was one of those rare occurrences where St. Joe, Rigetti, Santa Maria, Pioneer Valley all had a home game. Orchid Academy had a home game. It's the first time since Orchid Academy's played football that they were without a field. Well, so I bring that up because there was Friday had a lot of good positive mo football mojo connected to San Inez because... Orchid Academy really enjoyed playing at San Inez, and uh, Joe, you were right to feel good about San Inez High. Yeah, they're on the road at San Marcos, came up with a 52 to nothing win. Yeah, I felt real confident about that one. I, I think San Inez is still still gonna you know, start out hot like they did last year. Mike McCoy was huge. He might be our player of the week. He's leading in the poll on our blog right now, and uh, I think that's a deserved honor for him. Almost 300 yards passing, 400, or four passing TDs. Uh, the, ran, ran the ball really well, so uh, Mike McCoy had a big game and led San Inez to a 52 to nothing win. Uh, we'll see if they can keep it going this week. Uh, they actually play at home uh, Friday night, so that's good. They'll be back home, but they definitely started the 2016 season, 2016 season right with a big win. Yeah, they'll be playing Carpinteria, and uh, they're 
the Warriors uh, are an annual game for them. That's a traditional early season matchup, and uh, it's a rivalry just like you, you know, your Lampo Cabrillo type of rivalry or your uh, Rigetti and St. Joe type of rivalry. Actually, uh, that game is my lock pick this year. Um, San and Inez looked very good in their opener. This will be Carpinteria's. This will be Carpinteria's opener. Um, teams, a lot of coaches say, typically make their biggest improvement from their first game to their second. Mm -hmm. So San Inez is my lock pick for this one. Yeah, I was going to do uh, Orchid Academy as my lock pick because <laughs> they they can't lose. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if that's allowed, um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll go to a game that actually will happen Friday night, or at least I hope it will. Uh, St. Joe, I'm going with St. Joe, 33-15 over Rigetti. That's my lock. <laughs> I think the Knights got this one. Um, I think Rigetti will improve. I think they are better than what they showed. It's just going to take a little more time than I thought, so I think St. Joe will win that one. I think it will be close in that first half, but uh, St. Joe has too much too much firepower and they're gonna pull away. Well, you know, in fairness, I forgot to mention, Rigetti did, uh, Coach Ed Herman did say that he had seven players out for this one, and judging by the amount of players that had their shirts on but not suited up, I think that is correct. So that, that might have an impact. They were without seven players last week. Okay, well, uh I think my lock pick is actually uh, one that um, head coach Andrew Jones is it, is hoping it's true, which is Lompoc over Napomo. You know they've had so much trouble with Napomo in the last two years, but the reason I'm making a point of picking them this year is I think uh, I think Lompoc's in a better mental spot uh, this time around, and I think Lompoc very much has the talent uh, which they've always had. They've always had the talent adva advantage. Just Napomo plays really hard, and Napomo plays smart. Uh, but this time I got Lompoc as my lock pick. Yeah, I think Lompoc might be the most impressive team from week one. You know, I think we had we all had voted Lompoc the number one team in the area, and they kind of lived up to it. And I thought AG was the second best team, but I think that was a convincing win by Lompoc. And they, you know, I picked AG to win that game, but you know, Lompoc was just just too strong, and AG was not quite where we thought they were offensively. Seems like they might have taken a step back in that defense needs to get in order. I know Lompoc is tough to stop on the ground, but it definitely seems like AG has some things to work on. And they got a they got a decent preseason slate playing some Bakersfield area schools, so that'll definitely get them tuned up. And I think the Pac-5 title chase is going to be a lot more interesting than, than we may have thought with Paso and Atascadero both looking really good, oh, you know, yeah. last week. I'm going to, uh, you know, I think Lompoc and, and is an easy pick. St. Joe, I'm thinking they're going to win it. Uh, but I'm going to pick Pioneer Valley over San Luis Obispo as my lock for the week. Oh, man. We're really beating up on slow. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I think that Santa Maria did a really good job. And yeah. uh, uh, and I think they earned that win. I, I'm not saying that slow is a, a, a doormat. But Pioneer Valley showed a lot this first week. Uh, and uh, they beat a, a tough uh, Napomo team that, Tony Dodge and company have won a couple, uh, uh, what are they now, Northern League titles in the last few years. They've been a great playoff team, and Pioneer Valley showed that it came to play, and, and I think they're going to take advantage of slow while they're down a little bit, and they're going to win that. It might be a closer game, but it, I think it's going to be 21-14 you know, to 14, uh, would be about as close as uh, San Luis Obispo will get. Now, Pioneer Valley might go up even higher than that, but I don't think that they'll... Uh, uh, they'll lose it. So I'm going with Pioneer Valley as my lock. Since you guys took the, the you took the gimme. I think <laughs> if Pioneer Valley Ooh. just does what it does and doesn't have any major missteps, they should be 2-0 and o by the, for the season when the, that game ends. Yeah, yeah, if they were to fall to slow, that would probably be, that would definitely be a huge letdown. And I believe that is a Saturday night game at slow, so it's a little bit different. Um, moving away from football, we've gotten some, uh, some pretty big news out here on the Central Coast. Um, some of our area schools might be moving to a different section. You know, Santa Maria Valley schools have long been in the southern section, but we've received word on Wednesday that about eight Central Coast schools are planning on moving to the central section. They're calling it a, a seceding, so it'll be interesting <laughs> how that plays out. Um, right now we have AG, St. Joseph, Pioneer Valley, Santa Maria, Mission Prep, Atascadero is kind of on the fence. Um, Paso Robles is on the list. Paso Robles is on that list. Um, Santa Inez and the two Lompoc Valley schools have shown no interest 
thus far, you know, moving to the central section. So, you know, it's going to be a real interesting thing. Uh, a lot of us think it's going to be a little more balanced, a little more uh, competitive equity there for, for some of the area schools, maybe Santa Maria especially, moving to the central section, and it might even cut down on some travel, or at least it should. So it's kind of interesting to see how this will play out over the next, you know, six months, eight months. I think they have a, a deadline for March of next year to kind of sort all this out. I think it, I've thought for a while that it would make sense for schools in the northern part of our coverage area, including Santa Maria High School, to move to the central section. Um, besides geographically, I think a lot of the schools in our area ha just have more in common demographically with a lot of the schools in the central section than they do with some of the schools in the southern section, particularly the Orange County schools. Uh, by the same token, I think it would make sense for the schools in the southern end of our coverage area, so such as saying is, to, to, to stay where they are. I think um, some of them like the league they're in, they like the geographic situation they're in, they're much closer, they're closer to, they're closer to the Los Angeles area schools and San Fernando Valley schools than schools in the central section, particularly the ones in the northern reaches of it. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I said before, um, I mean, when we were getting this news, I think you could almost just as a rule say the San Luis Obispo schools should be in the central sec uh, San Luis Obispo County schools should be in the central section. And since so much of this has to do with geography and Santa Maria is almost literally on the fence of the San Luis Obispo County line, um, then it kind of is up in the air for almost each Santa Maria Valley school as to what they want to do. Um, uh, but it's, uh, it's an interesting thing to think about because a lot of these schools in, in the Central Coast have a lot of tradition of, southern, of playing in the Southern section, of having a lot of pride in winning an incredibly tough section. Um, so it, it's not as easy a decision as just saying it's a shorter drive or just saying we'd be more competitive. Um, I'm willing to bet there are some AG coaches who like competing in the Southern section, for example. Well, you've got just over 400 schools in the southern section. It's the state's largest section. Uh, and when we're talking playoffs, you can easily have uh, Paso Robles going to southern Orange County mm -hmm. uh, or Paso Robles going over to Bakersfield. Uh, it's for them a shorter ride. Not everybody's on board just yet, but it sounds like that in addition to these eight teams that we know about, uh, several others are seriously thinking about making the move as well. Uh, and Atascadero and Santa Maria so far uh, haven't made up. They're on the fence. So, and then, no, Santa and Maria High is on the Oh, they're they are on, on the list. They're yeah. definitely. They, but, um, if Pioneer Valley and Rigetti go, apparently they have to go because um, according to the Santa Maria Joint Union High School, from what I heard, superintendent's office, um, they either all play in a central section or they all play. All three of them either play in the central section or they all three play in the southern section. Either they all stay or they all go. Hmm. A, split, a split between the three would not be allowed. But the three southernmost schools, Lompo, Cabrillo, and San Inez, uh, they may not like the ride. They're closer to Santa Barbara than everybody else. Uh, and they could play against Carpinteria, Dos Pueblos, San Marcos, Santa Barbara High School. Uh, and you know, Lompo football could fit in the leagues, and some of the the water polo, some of the golf, tennis, uh, they'd fit right in down there. So they may just say, "Well, we'll see if one of those leagues will take us." You know, if I was a coach, or in, or in the yeah, somewhere in the athletic decision making, um, say in Aurora Grande or some other San Jose County school, I would want to move to the central section. Yeah. If I was say in um, the St. Inez vicinity, I would want to stay in the southern section. Well, if only we had high-speed rail, right? <laughs> Jeez, we wouldn't have to worry about any of these drives or anything like that. Yeah, just initially, it, it's definitely a very interesting story, and we're <laughs> definitely going to um, follow that as it develops. Um, but that's all we got for this week's show. Um, be sure to check out our game of the week once again. That's going to be at Rigetti, St. Joseph at Rigetti. Pre-game show is at 6.45 p.m., the Battle for the Shield. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, be sure to follow us on our social media accounts, Facebook and Twitter. And we'll, uh, we'll be at a lot of games Friday night. Napomo, Santa Maria, 
uh, San Inez and Cabrillo High School will be at all of them so make sure you check us out online and in print uh, in your Saturday uh, Santa Maria Times or your Sunday Law Folk Record uh, so on in print online here at 805 Sports Talk uh, we've got it all covered for you so thank you for joining us this week we'll see you next week right back here at 805 Sports Talk <sighs>